Uh, I just want to welcome everybody. I'm Stephanie Van Hook. I'm uh, the executive director of the Meta Center for Nonviolence. Uh, this is Michael Negler, uh, the president of the Meta Center, and uh, my teammate. I'm the host of a, a radio show called Nonviolence Radio. I'm usually uh, not seen on screen, so uh, going from radio to television uh, and webinars is always a little bit strange for me. So the Meta Center exists. Ela's here. Welcome, Ela. So the Meta Center exists to help people practice nonviolence more safely and more effectively. We have a host of uh, programs, including our radio show, Nonviolence Radio. Uh, you can find all of our programs at uh, metacenter.org. And I want to thank our uh, co-sponsors of this event, Waging Nonviolence. They are the best news source for nonviolence uh, in the world. Um, very pleased to have their support. When we first had the opportunity to interview uh, Dr. Kasif um, back in uh, in mid October, Waging Nonviolence helped us immediately publish that on their website to help reach more people. And um, many of you are here because of Waging Nonviolence. So thank you very much to uh, Eric and Brian and your team over there. And I also want to give a shout out to our friends at Meta Peace Team who also helped to publicize this event. Uh, rather widely uh, and uh, on last minute notice. So thank you so much to our friends um, who are doing unarmed civilian protection work and conflict de-escalation work with Meta Peace Team. They often have a presence uh, in uh, Israel, Palestine as well and in the West Bank. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to uh, our friend Rabbi Lynn Gottlieb and I will give you a fuller introduction when it's time for your questions, but I'm just really grateful for you, Rabbi Lynn, and all of your support in helping get this uh, this event going. Um, so over to you, my friend. Thank you and uh, greetings to everyone who is here for this important conversation. I was asked to reflect on what it means to have a safe conversation and that immediately um, broke my heart because there is no safety in Gaza. And, and so I, I feel in this moment willing to surrender that safety in order, my own emotional safety, in order to be fully present to this conversation. And I'd like to begin just by I'm mentioning, saying the words of Palestinian poet Hin Judah, who wrote this poem in the midst of the devastation of Gaza. What does it mean to be a poet in wartime? It means that you apologize. You apologize excessively to the burned out trees, to the birds without nests, to the flattened houses, to the long cracks in the road's midsection, to the children pallid in death and before it, and to the face of every grieving or murdered mother or father. This is the spirit in which we're holding this conversation. And it has become a custom in many circles um, throughout Turtle Island, which is the indigenous name of uh, the United States, which is the colonial, one of the colonial powers that are driving this conflict that we um, offer, we've been asked to offer by our indigenous relatives land acknowledgement and this is a land acknowledgement that i wrote in in community with other um folks over the years uh, including indigenous activists we the colonial settlers living as guests upon wichin territory in my case acknowledge the ongoing harms of genocide colonization and patriarchy we walk this pilgrimage, which will be tomorrow, a Gaza interfaith ceasefire pilgrimage that has a thousand people signed up. 
we watch, we walk this pilgrimage to repair these harms and rematriate the land. In the spirit of the Chechenyo word, or in one place living together, we offer this conversation and this pilgrimage as part of our reparations to return land to indigenous people, including Palestinians, and heal the earth. We pledge to turn away from actions that lead to mass expulsion, land theft, environmental devastation, unjust extraction of resources, the destruction of sacred sites, and genocide. We have harmed, we have betrayed our spiritual values. We acknowledge these harms and pledge our devotion to creating a culture of repair. I hope that these words bring us into the circle of communities that wish to create cultures of repair. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I want to uh, turn now to Dr. Kasif. Um, he has, he's an Israeli politician. He's represented the Hadash and the Knesset since April, 2019, uh, back in February. He, they tried to remove him for his um, <laughs> his views on uh, peace and um, security, uh, being those of mutual peace and mutual security uh, for Israelis and Palestinians. And um, I just thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kasif, for being here today. I, I, I want to um, thank you so much uh, for for your courage. And thank you. Uh, your witness yeah. and um and in your perseverance uh in within the Knesset for human rights. Thank you. Um how about you get us started and, and talk a little bit about um about your background, how you got involved in, in the Knesset, where you where you're coming from, and um uh, maybe even a little bit about your impeachment uh trial. Well, first of all, thank you, and uh, and thank you, uh, Rabbi uh, Gottlieb, for what you said and quoted. Thank you all for having me. Uh, to be brief, because it's quite a long story, and I, I'm afraid you don't have the time. We cannot afford the whole story. So my parents say that since they, they remember me, before I remember myself, I was quite allergic to injustices. <laughs> So uh, this is quotation of my mother. This is not self, you know, self flattering or something like that. Uh, so, uh, so it it does go with me since I remember myself. I, I was involved here or there in different struggles: worker struggles, women struggles, uh, the Palestinian struggle, etc., uh, etc. Et <laughs> and uh, when I just got first to the university, the first degree at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. So I began to be activist. I was more or less, I was in a youth movement, you know, a socialist youth movement. Uh, and uh, but that's too long to specify. So I just go ahead and refer to the where, where and when I found myself in Hadash, which is based on the Communist Party of Israel. And I joined it uh, in the beginning of 1988, when the first intifada, the Palestinian uprising, uh, just began. I think it was two or three weeks old. And I was sent by the military to serve in Gaza. See the irony? And I refused. So I was the first person to be imprisoned for refusing to serve in the military during the first intifada. There were people who refused before me, but not in the Intifada. So I emphasize that I was the first uh, object or was imprisoned in the first Intifada. And, uh, and thereafter, I was imprisoned another three times. So altogether, I spent four terms in military prison in Israel. 
for the same crime as it were, for refusing to oppress the Palestinians, to take part in the oppression and occupation of the Palestinians. And, uh, and then I joined the Communist Party in Hadash, and uh, it's 36 years now uh, since I joined the, the party, and uh, I was afterwards a professor at the university up till 2019. I mean, I finished my PhD in England and postdoc in the States, etc. And uh, when, when I came back uh, to Israel, I uh, also uh, joined uh, again to the to Hadash and the, the Communist Party, in which I'm a member until now. And in 2019, I was uh, elected in our uh, internal elections to, to be uh, number three in our list. And ever since, I'm in the Knesset, although not everybody is happy about it, as you know. And uh, <laughs> surprise, surprise. So just a few words, if I have the time, about the impeachment. In 2016, the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, enacted a law, which is obviously anti-democratic, to say the least, which allows them a majority of 90 members of the Knesset out of 120 that they are all together. Uh, to impeach another member of the Knesset. This is a clear-cut example of tyranny of the majority. And, uh, and obviously it cannot, uh, you know, it cannot be reconciled with basic principles of democracy. In my view, this law and democracy are mutually exclusive by definition. And uh, it was never used, at least not on the whole process, to be, again, I, I'll try to be very short, but the, the process in impeaching a, a member of the Knesset by other members of the Knesset consists of three main in, in components or elements or stages. First, there must be collected you know, at least 70 signatures of members of the Knesset to begin a motion. Once the signatures are, uh, are uh, achieved, then there is a discussion and a vote in the House Committee. If 75% in the House committee vote for the impeachment. It goes to the uh, plenum, and there, there's a need, as I said before, of 90 out of 120. So I joined a, a, a petition that was initiated by some uh, Israeli activists in support of South African appeal to the uh, International Court of Justice in The Hague. And uh, obviously, what we are, the, the, the petition said two basic things. First, that the, the ongoing in Gaza should be investigated under the suspicion of genocide. And secondly, that the war should be stopped because the ICJ has the authority to order to stop the war. And obviously, that was very important for us in order to save lives, primarily of those who are systematically butchered on a daily basis, which are, which is the Palestinians in Gaza, mostly innocent civilians. We all know that at least 75% of the victims in Gaza are innocent civilians, mostly children. We know for sure that out of uh, more or less 35,000 who have been killed, as we know, and we know that the death toll is going to rise, unfortunately, but up till now we know more or less about 35,000 at least 15,000 of them are children. <laughs> so since the government of Israel is no interested in stopping the bloodshed, to say the least, we found ourselves obliged, morally speaking, to appeal to the authority, international recognized that authority, or recognized by, by the state of Israel, by the way, as well, which is the ICJ. I was accused by a member of the Knesset in supporting armed struggle against Israel because I signed this petition. So see the Orwellian, the irony of this situation, because I signed the petition against violence, I was accused in supporting violence. <laughs> it, is, it, it is as ridiculous as it sounds. I, and this is why I call it Orwellian, after George Orwell, of course. So... <laughs> They said, because in order to impeach a member of the press, that before, there are only two bases that, uh, that uh, such a motion can be can be done in the first place. Either 
supporting racism or supporting armed struggle against Israel. And so I was accused of supporting uh, armed struggle against Israel and even supporting Hamas, which is total non totally nonsense, you know. Uh, so eventually they got the signatures. There was a motion in the House Committee in which uh, almost uh, unanimously uh, there was a vote against me. But in the plenum, they got 86 votes against me. They needed 90, so it failed. But uh, I must say that the fact that out of 120, 86, including people, members of the Knesset who are regarded as not as rightists, but as center, you know, as Democrats or liberals, the fact that they voted, some of them voted to impeach me with no reason, with no basis. It was a total and clear unlawful vote that should bother us, should bother us very much so, because it shows how much the public opinion in the Israeli society in general and within the parliament in particular radically moved to the fascist edge. And it's still moving, so it's very uh, uh, dangerous. I finish now with that because I could give a lecture, but I don't think that you're interested now. <laughs> <laughs> so much. We're going to um, continue this conversation with you through um, our panelists. Sure. And I'd like to uh, invite uh, Mubarak Awad uh, to, to converse. Um, Mubarak helped launch the first Intifada, and he was exiled from Jerusalem by the Israeli government in 1988. He founded the Palestinian Center for the Study of Nonviolence. He's the founder of the National Youth Advocate Program, and he's founder and current president of Nonviolence International. Thank you, Mubarak, for joining us in this conversation. And uh, we invite uh, your, your participation. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Dr. Kasef, for a great uh, struggle that you have within yourself and also with your colleagues. Thanks. Uh, because I'm, I also have been so much surprised that uh, that even you got seventy votes out of ninety. That's too much. That means not only the left or uh, in Israel society are moving way, way to the right. And that is uh, so much dangerous because uh, many times Israelis say we have nobody to speak with when the Palestinians. And now it's turned around. Now it looks like we as Palestinians, we see that there is nobody to speak with in peace within the uh, Israeli Knesset. And we are seeing that further and further, not only by politician, by the public opinion, uh, their uh, vote and uh, about they are interested in finishing Hamas and following Netanyahu and his group to destroy Hamas and to continue even all the countries in the world telling Israel, don't, don't, don't. And Israel say to the whole world, go to hell. We are going to do what we want and we are not uh, even listening to you or having advice from you. And that becomes a very dangerous thing, not only for the Palestinians, but for the whole world. And uh, the thought is that the Lama, what a country can do, what the United States can do, what Germany, France, Europe, uh, Britain, and everybody, when a country like Israel decided, uh, no, we don't want to listen to you. We don't want to listen to the UN. We don't want to listen to the international law of justice. We, and we want to do what we want to do. And then still we are calling ourselves democracy. And uh, is, is it Israel? got rid of the idea that Israeli society is a democracy or not? Is it just voting for a 
somebody who's a prime minister like Netanyahu again and again is that a democratic concept and it's uh, dangerous. I felt so dangerous on that because also in Germany, uh, Hitler was voted by the people and it's a democratic thing. So it makes you thinking, what is democracy at this time and how we have to really think of democracy and what is the essence of humanity and how many people have to die and still calling it a democracy or acceptable. And that's not acceptable in, in my book at all. And, you know, when a child dies, is one child is too many and now we are looking at so many children so many women and the destruction is overwhelming that the people in israel are not seeing and still feel that destruction should continue and that's the tough part and where the idea that you as a person stood firm and hard and that is very courageous. You know, I know how Israel could destroy your name, could destroy you uh, with all your family, could make life miserable for you. Because I went through similar things that you have. Even the Israeli will have a casket in the street with my name that this is where my future is. And the, even I decided, no, I have to go to the Supreme Court and challenge the Israelis in the Supreme Court. And I find difficulty to challenge the Israelis when it's uh, they, the judges there at that time, they didn't run w with favor to any person who, who is a Palestinian in a, in a court. I just went into a trap there knowing that I would not, I will be still deported. Whatever, the Supreme Court doesn't have the will to come against a government. And you did that, so that is a very encouragement for me to hear you and to meet you, and God bless you. Thank you so very much. It's very, it's very moving what you said. I, I really appreciate that. Um, would you, would you like to um, follow up and comment on anything that um, Mubarak has offered here, such as um, what does democracy look like, or? Uh, you, you asking me? Okay. <laughs> Yes, first of all, I don't know if Mubarak heard me. I really appreciate what he said. It's a way heartwarming and I'm honored to uh, to to hear such, uh, you know, encouraging and good words from him. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Mubarak. Thank you. Uh, look, I think in my view, the basis value in democracy is equality. I mean, I mean it's very even easy to prove that, you know, if I may, if I have the time. Uh, because, of course, uh, you know, uh, my PhD and my, um, actually I may say my profession uh, is uh, mainly political philosophy. So I did, uh, you know, dwell quite a lot on this issue when my PhD is on democracy, by the way, specifically <laughs> philosophy of democracy. So I think that uh, and there are many debates, disagreements, uh, between different Democrats as to the very concept of democracy. What is, it, what is it exactly? What is the right balance between, for instance, equality and liberty? Because some argue that uh, those two are in tension. So just a second, something about that. Uh, I think it's very easy to prove that modern democracy is based on the value of equality. How should we prove that? We have to ask ourselves, one of the main principles of democracy, even in its very minimal procedural perception, is the, the, is the majority rule. Why majority rule? With all, of course, the limitations, because democracy, especially modern one, 
cannot uh, stick to a majority rule that oppresses the minority or the individual, of course. There are many limitations and checks and balances, as it is normally called in the states. But still, why the principle of majority rule exists? Because quantity should decide who is going to be in power, for instance. Why quantity? Because there's no difference between the voters as far as quality is concerned. Had it was different, it had it been, it been different. So quality, a quality, not quantity, but quality would have decayed, dictated the decisions. The only reason that quantity dictates the decision is because there is a sometimes, sometimes implicit assumption that there's no qualitative distinction and or differences between individual human beings. In other words, we are equal. That's the basis of democracy. Now I'm saying this very uh, superficial, I uh, dare say, uh, uh, introduction, because Israel was never real democracy. It was never a real democracy. Since day one, it couldn't. It couldn't because it was never based on equality. Even if I ignore, which I cannot, but just for our, for the sake of argument, even if I ignore the crimes of the Nakba, the total destruction of the Palestinian people, the deportation, the massacres, etc. After the state of Israel was established, there was also always entrenched into the system Jewish supremacy. How can you refer to that as, as a democracy? That cannot be. And our struggle, you know, my party specifically, since day one, we are the only party who has always been, you know, a partnership of Jews and Palestinians in the Knesset as well. It's a value for us, a supreme value this partnership, this brother and sisterhood. So we've been struggling all those 76 years to turn Israel into a real democracy, which means equality, real equality, profound equality, no supremacy to neither of the people there, neither Jews, nor Palestinians, nor others. But since 1967, and the occupation of the West Bank, Gaza Strip, and East Jerusalem, the situation has been in a continuous deterioration and escalation. Because now, it's not only that there's no equality as they defined it before. Now, there's li literally millions of people. Nowadays, it's 50% between the Jordan River and the Mediterranean. 50% of the people have no basic rights. Before we talk about the carnage that goes on in Gaza, the ethnic cleansing that goes on in the West Bank and in East Jerusalem, etc., etc. Before we even mention that, basically there are no basis rights to the Palestinian people who live under the Israeli occupation. Not only to vote or be elected, but freedom of movement, freedom of expression. Do you know, for instance, that the all Palestinian people who live in the West Bank under military rule for almost 60 years, uh, uh, for almost 60 years now. They live under military rule, which means they are living, they believing under a military system and not civic one. They are, they, they go to military courts normally when they face trial. They are, this, they, they, they are not allowed to demonstrate, you know, that according to the law, to the military law that the Palestinians are subject to in the West Bank, if a Palestinian goes out to demonstrate peacefully a non-violent demonstration, according to the law, one may be charged and sentenced to 10 years in prison. What kind of democracy is that? And now, nowadays, in the last five or months or more, we've been facing this terrible ongoing carnage in Gaza and destruction and starvation. This is something that I, 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 I must say that I'm in shock, to say the least. 
that the international community is silent, totally silent. Sometimes you know they throw out to the to the to the <clears throat> air some condemn condemnation, but they don't do anything, and people are continuously killed in Gaza. I saw pictures of babies starving to death. Pictures that remind us remind us pictures from other places in the past. That's unbearable, unbearable. And I put the blame first and foremost, of course, on the fanatics in Israel and among the Palestinians. I have no sympathy for the people of Hamas, I must say. The carnage they carried out is unacceptable too. So I put the blame first and foremost on the fanatics on the Israeli government, which consists of full-fledged fascists, but also on the international community, and especially the so-called liberal democracies that don't do anything. I just hope they will shortly, because otherwise this area is going to erupt even more. Mubarak, would you like to follow up on that? That's uh, very much of an open discussion because if if democracy is being silenced in most of the countries, what other system should we have? Or how could we bring a system that is a just system? Is it the military? Is it the dictatorship? Uh, uh, we don't have, we were looking so much about countries that we say, here's a country that we could follow, or everybody could use the same ideology from that country. We don't have a country to follow. Are we looking something coming out of space or out of somewhere else that we say, hey, here is a just system, let's do it. And why, I'm not talking about the Israeli-Palestinian issue, why the whole world is so much confused and so much into either money and money and money, getting money, rather than putting the effort in social justice, oh. people, children, health, you know, <clears throat> to cure the cancer rather than having military uh, elements in every country. I mean, we have, we have difficulty to look at. And we, we have to start thinking of a better future for everybody. And um, to, to have a better future, everybody, I think the border is something that has to be taken away from every country. No borders. I don't believe in border. To give a right for anybody to go any place. Because our, our world is so small. And we are limiting itself to only Chinese, Americans, you know, Palestinians. No. It's it, we we have to start looking a different way of life to everybody that we are equal, and that I I think it it will come. It needs a lot of work, but it will come. Thank you, Steve. Um, Mubarak, would you like to respond? No, I totally agree. It reminds me of the. Famous song by John Lennon's, you know, imagine, imagine there are no, there are no, count, there's no count, there are no countries. <laughs> so uh, I totally uh, endorse that. I don't think it's a, it's a realistic nowadays, but as an ideal, I, I totally embrace it. Well, I'd like to, I'd like to turn next to Ila Gandhi. Uh, she's joining us all the way from South Africa today. Uh, she's a social worker, political activist in South Africa. She's a founding member of the 
Natal Organization of Women and served two terms in the South African Parliament representing the African National Congress, ANC. Uh, she's in the honorary chairperson of the Gandhi Development Trust and Phoenix Settlement Trust and co-president of Religions for Peace International. And she's also a very beloved member of the board of directors of the Meta Center for Nonviolence. Ila, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we'd love to have you now bring your uh, perspectives and uh, share a conversation with Dr. Kasif. So much. Um, and thank you, Dr. Kasif and uh, Dr. Awad. Uh, very interesting discussion. Um, I just want to turn to the South African experience and to say, you know, the turning point for South Africa was when African countries uh, became free, you know, um, our neighboring countries. And uh, when the British Prime Minister came to South Africa and, you know, they say, it was the wind of change, uh, winds of change speech that he made in our parliament. And I mean, that was like the turning point when <clears throat> people began to think that um, some changes have to be brought, brought about, because that is what, uh, you know, Mr. McMillan, I think was here and he said in his uh, speech that this change is inevitable. Now, at this stage, is there any pressure? That's my first question. Is there any pressure on the Israeli government to bring about change? Or are they just very powerful and there's no pressure for them to bring about change. I'd like to understand. Uh, shall I? Please. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you. Uh, and uh, nice meeting you too. Uh, the current government, the current government of Israel, uh, unfortunately, uh, I don't have any any hope from the elements that they are in this uh, government. First of all, the vast majority, unfortunately, I'd say that in pa with pain, you know, I do not say that, uh, in a, you know, in a kind of, uh, in order to mock them. I say that in real pain. Uh, we are talking a very about a very brutal uh, <clears throat> government and individuals within the government. Some of them are fanatics, bigots, who have no, se no sense of human respect, who have no sens uh, you know, sensitivity to human life. It's not my interpretation. They actually said that, you know, you know just to give you two examples. One uh, uh, minister, in the government. The finance minister, perhaps you know his name is Al Smotrich. He actually said about the Israeli hostages who are dying there in Gaza, in addition to the Palestinians who are killed on a daily basis that I mentioned before. He said that they are not the most important thing. And he's not the only one because there are, there are this strong element within the Israeli government that believes that the role of the government is actually to bring upon us in kind of Armageddon, to bring upon us a, a, a huge war and bloodshed that according to their, I should say, lunatic beliefs, insane beliefs, will bring the Messiah and the third Jewish temple. They truly believe. They say that Israel should uh, not only ki uh, uh, kill the people, the Palestinians, in, uh, or deport the Palestinians in, in Gaza, but uh, they argue, uh, they, they had a huge conference uh, a few months ago, two or three months ago, in Jerusalem, in which they actually argue that Israel should re-establish the Jewish settlements in Gaza 
on the uh, uh, wreckage of Gaza. And they, they, they don't really care about the security of anyone, obviously not of the Palestinians, but not even of the Israelis. So unfortunately, and, and Netanyahu is very, first of all, he's a psychopath. I said that very clearly. And uh, I said that uh, a few times in uh, different international and local media. In my view, Netanyahu is, be, is a, a psychopath. He doesn't care about the lives and well-being of anyone but himself. And because of that, he doesn't care that thousands and thousands of Palestinians have been killed. He doesn't care that the hostages, the Israeli hostages, are dying, and some of them, I guess, are already dead. He doesn't care even about the lives of the Israeli soldiers. So, unfortunately, there's no hope in this government. And by the way, uh, Benjamin Gantz and others who joined the government from uh, their party who is considered to be uh, in the center, not the rightist one. Uh, it is arguable, of course, but uh, they claim so. They said when they joined the government that they do so in order to relax the fanatics. But it seems that the other way around happened. Instead of stopping the, the, the bigots, the bigots are stopping them. So we, we we see an escalation. I just watched the news, you know, in a, a couple of hours ago, and Netanyahu said that Israel is planning to invade Rafa with or without the American support. That that's crazy. Now, in that sense, I must say that I'm quite pessimistic. But in the short run, I am optimistic in the long run. And I am optimistic in the long run for two reasons. First of all, my comrades and I will continue to raise our voice. We'll never shut up. We never give up. We'll continue to raise our voice and, I, and, it, and it penetrates. I know that this voice, although we are a minority, even I may say a persecuted minority, sometimes brutally and violently persecuted. But the voice is uh, strong and loud and it penetrates into public, in the pub, into the public at large. This is one reason why I'm optimistic. And by the way, that gives me the wind or the, the power to continue with all the difficulties because I'm, First of all, I'm totally sure and believe my, uh, that this is the right way. But secondly, I believe that uh, we are making a change slowly, gradually, apparently too slowly, but still we are making a change. And the second reason that I'm optimistic is that you can already begin be, be, see the, the shift in the, in, in the public opinion. You can see that more and more people go out to the streets to demonstrate against the government, calling to uh, impeach the whole government and, uh, and to raise a voice against the assault on Gaza, against the war. And it comes also more and more from families of the hostages. So I believe that, but one thing is missing. And this is a pressure from the, the world. We need to join forces and to, so to speak, to make a kind of a division of labor. Our labor is primarily to make an, the efforts to change the public opinion in Israel and by that changing the structure of the Knesset, the government, etc., and to move forward towards peace. And I'm not talking just about, you know, ending this terrible carnage in Gaza, terrible war. I'm talking about ending the occupation, reaching a Palestinian state, so uh, uh, establishing a Palestinian independent state so the Palestinian people is at last free. And of course, to move forward to a good neighborhood and to be good neighbors. That's the only thing that can solve those problems we are dealing with now. So this is our role to do that here in our society. But we do need your help. We do need the help of the international community. As long as, for instance, the United States 
vetoes decisions to stop the war in the Security Council, just to take one example. And I know that today the veto was uh, casted by China and Russia. So, of course, the United States is not the only. Uh, but uh, that's what I'm saying, the international community. We need your assistance to put an end to this terrible bloodshed and to reach a just peace, because that's the only way that the peoples of this land will, will thrive. And uh, we can do that. But only if we do that together. We cannot succeed by ourselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ila, would you like to respond to that? Yes, I would. I just um, <clears throat> would like to say that I agree with you fully that uh, international community needs to do much more. Now, again, taking the example of South Africa, you know, we had anti-apartheid com committees in almost every country of the world. And um, we didn't only depend on governments. So it wasn't, uh, there were some governments that uh, were, you know, sympathetic with our cause, but not all governments. And, but, but we still went around and organized the people, people in other countries, and those people put pressure on their governments as well as on our government by boycotting, you know, boycotting um, uh, the sports, cultural boycott, boycott of uh, economic uh, boycott. You know, any goods that come from the country were boycotted overseas. And that was done by the people themselves. They forged a broad unity, and you know, and because of that unity, their countries, they were able to pull off these kinds of boycotts. So it was the anti-apartheid movement that was a great help for South Africa. Sure, and no. I know that our country is going going to have a, a conference. I think it's uh, 9th of uh, May, or it's in the first week of May or so, that we intend to have a conference where we are inviting the international community, all our anti-apartheid organizations, we are inviting them to now um, link in solidarity with the Palestinian people. But I think at the same time, it is important to have a unity within the Palestinians as well. They need to forge a strong unity, have a person like we had Nelson Mandela inside the country, and we had Oliver Tambo who was outside the country. Sure. And these were two people who were recognized and by everyone, there was no division, you know, everyone agreed um, with them. And so that broad unity has to be forged within the country and also in exile outside the country. So two things, the anti-apartheid movement and the leadership, you know, a united uh, one, person that people can say this is our leader it's it's a very important aspect because unless you have that you are going to have internal fighting and once we are divided it's easy for the others to come in and so you know we we shouldn't be divided we should be very much united so I just want to throw those two things uh, for discussion. First of all, yes, I agree with you. Uh, look, any uh, classically, any colonial or oppressive regime 
uses the uh, infamous divide and rule uh, <clears throat> policy in order to undermine and uh, to fail just struggles of oppressed peoples. So the, in, in South Africa, it was, you know, Bota and later on uh, Mila, in, 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 afterwards uh, Bota and others, when they try, of course, to raise uh, Chief Butelezi and, uh, in order to undermine the ANC. <laughs> and, uh, and of course, uh, in the end of the 80s, uh, to some extent, and in some areas, as you know better than me, of course, the, <laughs> the violent clashes between uh, in Qatar and ANC was on the rise. This was in the service of the uh, oppressive apartheid regime. Luckily, Nelson Mandela was uh, accepted enough, internationally speaking, and of course, nationally speaking, to exceed those cleavages. And we know that uh, eventually he succeeded. And I, of course, salute Mandela and the ANC. And uh, I personally, many times, by the way, in the plenum at the Knesset, in our parliament, I quoted Joe Slobo. For me, is almost an, a, a character to imitate, you know. Joe Slobo, for me, is a hero. And uh, I mentioned him quite a lot in the Knesset. And, uh, <clears throat> or Chris Hani, for instance. So anyway, it is a terrible situation here that, uh, again, the divide and rule between Hamas and uh, Fatah, within the Palestinian uh, people is created and encouraged by the Israeli governments and especially by Netanyahu. I mean, if I go back to the really terrible carnage that Hamas did in October 7, in which, by the way, I personally lost some friends who were killed by Hamas. People were, were my partners to our struggles, some of them, and were killed by Hamas on October 7th. So... <laughs> When I uh, uh, when I go back to that, we put the responsibility uh, to a great extent on Netanyahu because Netanyahu and his governments, in plural, not only this government, governments in uh, in the last more or less fifteen years, continuously <laughs> carried out this divide and rule policy, consciously strengthened Hamas and weakened the Palestinian Authority. And by the way, Netanyahu said that explicitly that he was interested in that. In 2019, Netanyahu said uh, that anyone who opposes a Palestinian state like he does must weaken the Palestinian Authority and strengthen Hamas. Even Smotrich said in 2015, and I quote, really, word by word, that the Palestinian Authority was a burden and the Hamas was an asset. Now, why did they say that? First, because they wanted this divide and rule. Once they can uh, say to the public in Israel and, uh, and internationally as well, look, we want to speak with the Palestinian leadership, but there is no Palestinian leadership. There is the Palestinian Authority in the West Bank. There is a Hamas. A fanatic organization in Gaza, who are we going to speak with? They manipulated the situation and created this situation in order to avoid any way of negotiations towards a libera liberation. Now, it's not only words. Netanyahu literally, and it's not a secret, everybody knows about it in Israel and everywhere. That throughout the years, Netanyahu actually transferred millions of dollars from Qatar to Hamas. The, this money was used by Hamas to dig those, you know, underground tunnels to attack Israel like they did in uh, October 7. So as far as dividing the rule is concerned, as far as the divisions within the Palestinian people, the tragic, the, 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 the disastrous cleavage within the Palestinian people is concerned, we still, in Palestinians, I mean, still haven't overcome this uh, cleavage. And I put the blame on Israel, on the Israeli governments. This is, and I agree with you, this should be, we should, this should be overcome. In order to overcome it, there is, in my view, 
perhaps I, I, others may disagree with me. I'm just speaking up my view. I think there is a, there is a Palestinian Nelson Mandela. And I'm talking about Marwan Barghouti. Marwan Barghouti is a Palestinian Nelson Mandela. He's been, I think now 21 years already in Israeli prison. Last week, he was beaten hardly in prison by Israeli uh, police. Uh, and uh, he's the one who can lead the Palestinian people into a unity and peaceful unity. Peaceful unity and, and lead the Palestinians to liberation. And it's not a coincidence that the governments of Israel wants him to stay in prison. Just, I, I'll finish with one sentence because I know that I spoke too much. Sorry, I apologize. That uh, something like, I think it was about 15 or 20 years ago. I don't remember exactly, I'm sorry. There was a letter that Marwan Barghouti was one of uh, its uh, uh, organizers of prisoners, political, Palestinian political prisoners in Israeli prisons from different factions, movements, and parties, from uh, uh, Islamic Jihad, Fatah, uh, uh, Democratic Front, etc., etc. And they supported this letter in which they said that they, they, uh, they, uh, they accept the idea of two-state solution, and they were going to uh, refrain from a violent struggle head there was an agreement with Israel to establish a Palestinian independent state in the territories that Israel occupied in 1967. Marwan Barghouti was one, probably the leader of this uh, project. The one who led the objection to this project was Ikhya Sinwar, now the leader of Hamas. When the government of Israel in general, Netanyahu in particular, had to decide which Palestinian prisoners were going to be released to swap with the soldier Gilad Shalit, if you remember, that was five years in the hands of Hamas, Netanyahu preferred to release Sinwar and not Marwan Barghouti. He preferred to release the one who opposed the peace project and to keep in prison the one who led the, uh, uh, the peace uh, uh, initi uh, initiative. And I think that answers what you said before. Thank you. Um, Ila, I will bring you and Mubarak back in a second, but I'd like to uh, switch over now to our friend Rabbi Lon uh, Lynn Gottlieb, uh, to have some time to ask questions before she needs to leave. Um, she's one of the first women to become a rabbi in Jewish history and is a pioneer Jewish feminist, human rights activist, writer, visual artist, ceremonialist, community educator, and master storyteller. She currently serves as a board chair of Interfaith Movement for Human Integrity and is the author of several excellent books. Uh, she identifies as a Shomeret Shalom, a practitioner of Jewish revolutionary nonviolence. Um, I will put her uh, website in the in the chat. Uh, thank you, Re Rabbi Lynn. Thank you for for the introduction, and thank you everyone um, for this conversation, this important conversation. I'm going to switch gears a little bit um, and go back to putting us in a colonial context, which you you've acknowledged and that Israel has never been a democracy. Um, I also want to acknowledge before I start this conversation that the whole Zionist myth of Jews being absent from the region for 2000 years and then returning home is exactly that. It's a myth. It's, it's Absolutely. A, and, and I don't want to erase um, Jewish people who are, um, who have a deep connection especially um, what Israel calls Mizrahi Jews or um, what Jewish people themselves <laughs> here are calling uh, Sawana Jews from um, Southwest Asia as, as they want to avoid the whole concept of the Middle East, which is a colonial, colonial idea. 
I want to ask, I'm, I want to ask you this. Um, clearly, we are in a different situation, different than South Africa, uh, because there, the genocide, th this is the word we need to use, genocide, which is intentional, which has been evolving as long as I can remember. I, star I, was, uh, I started coming to Israel, I was in Gadna in 1966. You know, I, I've been leading delegations there. I studied in Haifa. Um, I went to college. And even then, in that very brief moment of um, so many uh, Jewish Israelis liking to go to the old city in Jerusalem, you know, and, and that, that sense of openness and exploration, that was, that was shut down um, by 1973, really. And since that time, being a traveler on the ground, um, often spending time with um, my dear friend, Sami Awad, who is a third generation practitioner of uh, revolutionary Palestinian nonviolence. Um, it is very clear that this, these stages toward genocide was part of every single Israeli government and that um, a part that 1973, the so-called Oslo Accords, was actually the blueprint of apartheid. And Palestinian loss of land, political rights, judicial rights, the erasure of culture, all of these things leads me to believe that two-state solution is only furthering a sense of isolation and apartheid, um, especially given the genocide of Gaza and the desire to ship everybody to Egypt um, and to create an even small, that is the reality, and to create even smaller, so a, a smaller containing unit and then the West Bank. So there's two questions I have in this condition. One, I want to say there is a, an international solidarity movement. It is. We here in, in the Bay Area, a thousand people have registered for a ceasefire, uh, Gaza uh, interfaith ceasefire pilgrimage tomorrow, which we're mapping the 22 miles on uh, Ohlone land here in Wichin territory uh, from Gaza City to Rafa. That's and that's astounding, really. And this, I've never seen anything like this here. People are disrupting uh, the U.S. Um, government officials, and Biden is likely to lose the election over this, because we see sectors of our society rising up in ways they never had. This is a moment for Palestine. Palestine has become the moral compass of the world. One of our frustrations as, as movement builders, and you know, I'm a, I've been a member of JVP, Jewish Voice for Peace for a long time too, um, is, is not really having a sense beyond standing together, which is something that the American Jewish community likes, you know, the sense of we're talking to each other um, sort of on the Alinsky method and finding almost transactional methods of being together. And maybe that's what, what it's going to take, you know, low wages, housing, those kinds of things. But it never includes people from the West Bank or Gaza. These movements within Israel, as far as I remember, never really understand that, that Palestinians are live live from the river to the sea all people should be free and however that gets translated as a um as a political solution i feel like there is something about understanding the unity of the palestinian people from the river to the sea and that as long as that is not acknowledged and as long as israel doesn't come to terms with its colonial history not that not that Jewish people don't have history there and emotions and not that it's, it is the homeland, you know, it feels like the homeland and, and all that, but there's a difference in the structures 
of governance, which have always been colonial and Israel is no different. So it feels like we need to know where the pockets of solidarity are inside the Israeli state. Um, and like, is it resistor, is the resistors movement growing? Like is Zohrot a partner? Who are the partners that we need to lift up on that side? And on the other, it just feels cruel to ask, yes, Marwan Barghouti, and it also feels a little cruel to ask or to think about where is the Palestinian Gandhi? Because as long as as I've been alive, you know, if it were if 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 the Palestinian Gandhi were um or Nelson Mandela, he would have been assassinated. You know, because this is Israeli policy is to assassinate leadership. And and in this moment of genocide, where are the pockets of Jewish, Israeli, and Palestinian solidarity within 1948, and possibly between uh, uh, the other territories that we can um, that we can support and build this movement, this moral compass, this new reality that is uh, upon us. Hmm. Well, first of all, you know, this uh, debate about the one state, two state solution is an ongoing one, and uh, there's no chance we'll cover all of it. I will just like to say regarding your <clears throat> uh, comments or question, uh, I and my comrades in Khadash, we don't have any uh, ideological problem or you know, principal problem with uh, one state. We do argue that under the circumstances, uh, realistically, the two-state solution is the only <clears throat> uh, reasonable now under the circumstances. Uh, until the middle of the 40s, the, in the 20th century, the uh, main, uh, not the main, the, uh, our belief in the, in the party, the Communist Party then, it was before Hadash was established, Hadash was established based on the Communist Party, but it is a kind of a wider coalition in the in the middle of the 70s, 76, 77. But uh, until the, since the party was established in the 1919, until the middle of the 40s, we supported the one state for Jews and Palestinians in Palestine. And the struggle against the British uh, imperialism uh, was in order to get the colonial the imperialists out and to establish a one uh, state for uh, everybody between, as you said, the river and the sea. But we changed our uh, uh, perception in the middle of the 40s, given that things have changed. You know, we have to adjust ourselves to some extent to reality. Otherwise, we, we won't have any chance to change and to achieve justice that we are, we are all interested in. So we believe that at the moment, the only solution is that the two-state solution. And the, but, it, but of course, it also means that Israel itself must be democratized. That is to say that alongside as an independent Palestinian state in the old territories Israel occupied in June 67, uh, the state of Israel proper must be democratized in the sense that I mentioned in the beginning that it must be based on deep equality. There cannot be any kind of supremacy to anyone. Uh, so, but if in the future, upon consent of everybody who is involved, uh, there is a, a will to uh, transfer, transform the situ situation from, a two, from two states to one state or a kind of federation or confederation, so be it. But uh, at least as a, as, a, as a middle stage, there must be a Palestinian independent state. And uh, so this is in brief regarding what you said about uh, the two state versus one state, etc. Now within the state of Israel, uh, about two months ago, we formed a coalition, which is called the Peace Partnership. It consists of 44 different political 
and civil movements within Israel, Palestinians, Jews, and others. And we are all together in this partnership. Again, it's, it is formally called Peace Partnership. 44 organizations. We already organized a, a few demonstrations, Jewish-Palestinian demonstrations against the war, against the massacre, uh, calling to release the hostages as well. We must be very clear about that too. Of course, against the occupation and the ongoing racism and oppression of the Palestinian people, etc. So there are 44 different organizations with different emphasizes and, uh, and different uh, publics. And we act together. The problem is, and this is something that I didn't mention thus far, and I, 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 I imagine that you are familiar with that, that alongside the ongoing assault, a deadly assault on Gaza, there's an ongoing persecution against any political opposition within Israel. I mean, uh, uh, on top of what we said before about Israel not being never being a democracy, since October 7, the government of Israel has cynically been using the situation <clears throat> in order to pursue with the very same coup d'etat under the that was a, under the sugar-coated term judicial reform that you remember. The government continues with this coup using the smokescreen of the war. And that means, for instance, that students, especially Palestinian citizens. I'm talking now about the Palestinians within Israel, citizens. <coughs> uh, peace activists, anti-occupation and anti-war activists, mainly but not solely Palestinians within Israel, have been suspended from their university studies, have been fired from their workplaces, have been arrested, have been beaten in demonstrations, uh, solely because they tweeted or posted or said something that the government doesn't like. I'm not talking about supporting Hamas. I'm talking about objecting the war. I'm talking about expressing basic human sympathy for the children of Gaza. People have been persecuted and interrogated because of that. Until a few weeks ago, it was totally forbidden to demonstrate in Arab cities in Israel, under the auspices of the uh, Supreme Court, totally forbidden. We asked many times this peace partnership, those 44 organizations, and sometimes only Hadash. We asked many times the police, because here we need a license, you know, a permission to demonstrate. We cannot go to the streets and demonstrate without a permission if it exceeds 50 people, and if it includes marching in the streets with signs and uh, etc. And it was not given. It was totally forbidden to demonstrate against the war. It's a bit changing now, but still, I just read uh, recently, today, that yet again, every Saturday evening, there are demonstrations. And today there was two in Jerusalem. And the police brutally, violently, beat the demonstrators and tore, you know, uh, tear apart the placards and signs. So I mention all that first to pinpoint the dire situation that goes on within Israel, alongside the, of course, the massacre in Gaza. And secondly, in order to explain following what the rabbi said or, or, or asked, is that there are many organizations, Palestinian and Jews together, that uh, uh, and we act together against the war, against the oppression, against racism, etc. So that's another reason to be hopeful, by the way, following what I said before. So those are the ones who also need the international support. And I'm, I'm talking uh, first and foremost moral support. And there are many, many organizations, and I'm very proud to to be part of this uh, partnership. I hope I answered. Yes, I think that's that's the place where you left that we need to connect more because there is such a huge, at least here uh, in the United States, 
this is a moment where you see a thousand black pastors going on a pilgrimage with Jewish Voice for Peace. Um, you see um, also people being fired from their jobs and the, sa the same kinds of, of uh, uh, limitations on, and repression of free speech. It's happening here, principally on campuses where the weaponization of anti-Semitism is is um, sort of taking over and trying to repress the uh, moral outrage at what's happening. So I guess the next question is, at least since we are the major suppliers of weapons and we are the major um, GoFundMe campaign uh, for Israel, um, we have to continue to think about how to build the movement of resistance between our societies and strengthen. Absolutely. Because, because you, what you're doing will strengthen us um, because there's such isolation and, and doxing. And, you know, this has been going on for forever, but this is a moment. No. This is a moment where we really need to think about the tactics, uh, be, be intentional about our tactics. And I, and I pray for the right of return. You know, I know BDS, which which I came out for in 2004, um, boycott, divestment, and sanction has been a cr critical in waging educational campaigns, and as in particular, and building awareness. That's that's here, but it includes the idea of the right of return. Um, that is, that people do have the right to be compensated or return to everything that was stolen from them. And this so is part of, this always been a part of our platform of Hadash. No, no debate about that. Yeah. Uh, yes, it's it's part of our, formally part of our, uh, you know, manifesto, if you like. And by the way, if you mentioned that, I, I had a very interesting, I, I think, I hope, uh, uh, interview in the program of uh, Christina Manpu two days ago in, at CNN. And I said uh, that she asked me about, uh, again, about the support of the United States, which I'm obviously very critical of. And I said, don't send us a means of war. Do send us means of peace. Thank you for that. The, the reason I'm mentioning right of return is because it cover it. It runs through whether it's one state or two state, as you suggested. It it still runs through both options, uh, in the sense Whoa. that, yeah, that people there has to be some porousness about about reparations for people. Thank you so much uh, for for your thank you. Thank you, thank you. Um. Okay. Well, Rabbi Lim, thank you for joining us. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It was great to see everybody. So Michael is Professor Emeritus of Classics Comparative Lit Literature at UC Berkeley, where he founded the Peace and Conflict Studies Program. He's also the founder of the Meta Center for Nonviolence, and he is the author of Search for Nonviolent Future, Third Harmony, Nonviolence in the New Story of Human Nature, a documentary of the same title. Um, and he's my news anchor for uh, Nonviolence Radio. Michael, you have uh, burning questions for Dr. Kassif. I, I do. Uh, author, if I may, I will never have time. Cool. Yeah, thank you. I will never have time to ask you all the questions on my mind. But I, I wanted to make an observation here that might be of some use. And that is that typically nonviolent struggles that get stuck in one mode and particularly in the protest mode, they become very vulnerable. And the struggles that succeed are the ones that are flexible and they have different modes of approach and different strategies. And so I'm wondering if at this point we're seeing some thinking about, for example, what Gandhi used to call constructive program where we we build what we need without waiting for the opposition to give it to us. And as a matter of fact, Mubarak had some brilliant examples of that going uh, back in the 80s, where, as he said, every mother became every children's parent. 
and there was cottage industry, village industry. I'm not sure, in fact, what form it would take, but I'm asking you, uh, offer if there's some thinking that you've been hearing or hearing about of people thinking long term, what do we want this land to look like and how do we build it? alongside the necessity of demonstration and obstructive actions? Well, look, first uh, I must say that uh, that uh, the October 7th upset uh, the cars, you know, the apple cars. Okay. And uh, so it's very difficult to speak now about things that were almost obvious on 6th of October. It's very depressing, but that's the fact, that's a matter of fact. We, we are trying, when I say we, in, in a very wide, you know, definition, because we are talking about hundreds and thousands of people. But I think that one of the most important projects of nonviolent, uh, not only of nonviolent uh, resistance to the occupation and to ethnic cleansing, etc., but also of a also of a, uh, Building bridges to for the future. Yeah. Is the is the ongoing, for instance, uh, activities of Israelis and Palestinians in the occupied West Bank, for instance, olive harvest. Olives have been one of the most important, uh, not only economically speaking, but also, also on the symbolic level. Mm -hmm. Those are very crucial for the Palestinian people uh, in the West Bank, especially. And uh, settlers, with the assistance of the occupation forces, have been assaulting and, uh, you know, and uh, interrupting and bothering, etc., the Palestinians, especially during the olives harvest for years. So many years ago, there was a project that began and grew stronger and deeper and wider of Israelis who go, especially, not only, but especially during the harvest season, to the West Bank and together with the Palestinians harvest the olives on the streets. By the way, we've been uh, assaulted by settlers many times as well. Uh, Israeli activists were beaten. Uh, uh, Hagar uh, gave a uh, name of a 70-year-old woman, her lungs were torn, her, uh, her ribs were broken by settlers who beat her with bats during harvest. No one, by the way, was arrested, interrogated, let alone charged. And this is only one example. But still, those people, including people who are 70 and 80 years old, continuously go to the West Bank. Of course, we all made good friends as well. It's not only a kind of a, you know, a, just an instrumental connection or relation. It turned into a, a, an emotional and close friendship in, in many places. I think those things are so important. And I think this is the future. This is the future. Because mm -hmm. as I said, it's not only a nonviolent struggle against the evil and malicious atrocities done by the occupation and its proxies, but it, it's also a way to bring, to build bridges for the future. I think that's what we ought to do. It's very, very difficult now. Emotionally, I must say, uh, everybody's hurt. I mean, many Israelis, including peace activists, are still in shock and uh, and traumatized by the massacre of October 7. And on the other end, of course, Palestinians in the West Bank are traumatized by the ongoing carnage in Gaza. So it's more difficult. That's the reason I said before that 7 of October did upset the upper cuts. But, uh, but people don't give up. I, I mean, even people who find it difficult, physically speaking, they don't give up. And, it's so encouraging. Yeah. Uh, there is a concept in uh, in the study of nonviolence called the paradox of repression, which means yeah. when a state has to increase its 
violence in order to maintain its superiority, it is basically writing its own death warrant. That uh, And I, I'm getting the feeling that we might be approaching a paradox of repression here because what has what the IDF soldiers feel they have to do in Gaza, uh, not to mention other you know peripheral areas and struggles that are going on, are becoming unacceptable. And I mean this on two levels. First, it's becoming less acceptable in the international community and threatening the label that's been placed on Israel for close mm -hmm. to 75 years of victim when that's that true. when that label starts to dissolve then they become an ordinary another just another country that has to be judged by the standards of everybody mm -hmm. else but also we have this concept that has become well recognized recently called moral injury which identifies the fact that when people have to carry out these horrendous acts they themselves are so traumatized. Oh. No longer, they can no longer maintain it. So God forbid things would get any worse, but I'm wondering if you feel that we might be reaching that paradox mm -hmm. where they cannot continue anymore in this violent trajectory mm -hmm. and will be forced by the inner logic of the situation to bring about some kind of accommodation. I think it's very interesting because I said something not exactly the same, but something alike just yeah. a couple of days ago, a few days ago in a discussion. I don't remember with whom I'm sorry. I had many, I must say. <laughs> and I just actually quoted the philosopher John Stuart Mill. Hmm. John Stuart Mill, the British, the Scottish philosopher, he, te he coined the term benevolent despotism yeah <laughs> now what is benevolent despotism is when a despot or a tyrant holds the all power that can be used to oppress uh, the subjects but it doesn't use those powers so in that sense is a is a is a benevolent or good dictatorship dictator because he's a dictator he holds the power in uh, in a with his hands, in his hands, but he don't doesn't use them. But one way, but one stage or another says Mill, uh, that benevolent des uh, dictator will be, have to decide whether he prefers to be benevolent or dictator. Because once criticism rises, let alone resistance, if uh, the dictator allows the resistance to go on because he wants to be benevolent, then he won't be a dictator anymore. On the other hand, if he doesn't want to uh, lose his power as a dictator, he cannot continue with his benevolence. Yeah. So in other words, I think that there are, if you follow what I'm trying to say, it has something to do with the paradox you mentioned. This is another kind of paradox. And I think that for many years, the Israeli governments, since 1967, at least, truly believe that they can be you know, an enlightened occupier. There's nothing like that. Mm -hmm. And now, I think that now more than ever, we face this kind of eruption of the internal contradictory between those two moments. And in that sense, I think that, because, that this paradox is here. It's here to stay. And it's going to change things. One thing, if I may add, the reason that the Israeli media, apart from very, very few, doesn't inform the Israeli public about nothing that goes on in Gaza mm. is because, precisely because they are, they are afraid of, be, of, be, of this trauma you mentioned. So the, most of the people in Israel don't know what's going on in Gaza, partly because they are not exposed to it. The media doesn't show anything. By the way, it's not forced and forced to do so by the, by the government. They do that voluntarily, which is even worse. And the vast majority of, these, of the people in Israel don't want to know what's going on in Gaza. And because they don't want to see a villain in the mirror. That's the issue. 
And that's why they hate me, because I force them to look at the mirror. And I keep doing that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. You've been so generous with your time today. Um, and I want to thank and that's you okay. so much. <laughs> My um, pleasure. I, know, I, know. I, I just want to invite um, you know, everyone to say uh, goodbye. Uh, Mubarak, Awa, Dila Gandhi, Michael, um, you, Dr. Kasip, will end with you. So uh, Mubarak and Ila, please uh, add your last comments. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate that. And it's very, very much of looking for the future, which uh, we cannot just look at it. We have to change it ourselves. We have to be the agent of change there. And uh, in regard to a democracy, I always want feeling that if a country is a democratic, when there's a thousand or 10,000 people demonstrate, the government, like in the United States, for example, the House or the Senate, have to have a meeting with those who are demonstrating to say, what you are demonstrating, you are democracy. Let's hear you. And that becomes a democratic. The other thing that to understand the difficulty between even in the United States, the hate and the difficulty between uh, Arabs, Jews, Muslims, Christians. So what we decided that we took Philadelphia as an example, and we have a Christian, we have a, a Jew, and we have a Muslim to go to a church. And there is around 2,000 churches in the Philadelphia area, and they have to go to every church and to say, we want you, we try to ask you to just pray as a church, okay, for the people of Gaza, for the children of Gaza. And they are now 120 churches. They are welcoming them. They are saying that's great all, and we are... In, we are involving the churches. So there is something going, it's a little bit, but at least the church start taking responsibility of saying to the government, to Biden, uh, have ceasefire, stop the killing, stop sending money, you know, all that. And we didn't ask them, we asked them just to pray. And then they figure out themselves what they do. And that becomes very well. But thank you also, and I appreciate that. And I want to say a message to the people from South Africa. I am, we as Palestinians, we thank you so much, lady, about South Africa to bring the issue of the Palestinian in the International Court of Justice. That lift our spirit so much when it's very down. Thank you. Thank you, Mubarak. Thank you so much. Ila, any last comments from you? Thank you so much. Um, you know, it uh, gives us a bit of uh, insight into what is really going on. There's so much of misinformation that is coming out. Uh, and, uh, you know, your talk has uh, opened up that vision for us. So thank you, both of you, uh, you know, Dr. Ward and uh, Dr. Kasif. Um, thank you very much. Our side, we hope that uh, our conference is going to pave the way for, you know, for an international um, groups to get together and do something about the issue so there will be you know discussions on various ways of applying pressure on the israeli government to come to a settlement i think the one thing that concerns me is this question of one state or two states um, and I think that maybe we need to have a discussion on what is the best solution. Because for me, <clears throat> a two-state solution can be possible if 
both the states are equal. It can never be possible when one state is powerful and the other one is weak and dependent, as it is at the moment. Both states must be equal and must be just as, you know, um, on, a, on the same plane as each other. And then only can the two-state uh, solution succeed. That's my opinion. Um, also, one state like we have here in South Africa, where we've got, uh, we started off with the government of national unity. But at the moment, we are also having a lot of struggles in South Africa. And, uh, you know, I mean, we don't have two different states, and it's not possible to do that in South Africa, but uh, we do have problems, and that's internal, you know, it's, um, it's not necessarily racial problems, it's uh, problems about ideology, I think, more than anything else. Because, um, you know, the people, for them, um, freedom meant that they would have access to um, various resources. Their lives would change uh, for the better and so on, and which hasn't happened. So those are some of the issues that one can learn from. So going forward, maybe we should have more discussions like this, uh, you know, perhaps uh, focusing on what is the best solution, focusing on after, if uh, there is a settlement, what happens afterwards, what are the aspirations of the people and so on, and how can that be satisfied? Thank you Thank so you. much for giving me this opportunity. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Discussion. Thank you. Over the uh, Hitraot. <laughs> and uh, I do have a feeling that violence has overreached itself, <clears throat> is, has weakened itself, and that therefore we need to be very clear and strong about the alternative about nonviolence at this point. Absolutely. Reopening. So. Okay, okay. thank you so much. You're very well. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 And, bye, -bye everyone. and I'll just invite anybody who is here and has links and resources, you can go ahead and uh, email those to me, info at metacenter.org. Uh, and in our follow-up email, we will um, include those. Um, those resources. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, Ela. Bye. 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 Thank you. Silence. Uh, everybody who's here, thank you so much. Thank you. Wow.